Welcome to the Rabbitohs Top 4 Podcast. Proudly presented by What If, official travel and pathways partner of the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Here are your hosts, Mark Ellison, Shannon Donato and Jeremy Monaghan. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Rabbitohs Top 4 Podcast, the bubble edition. Today, now that we are in level three uh, precautions with the NRL, of course, the Rabbitohs Top 4 Podcast is powered by Audio Technica and proudly presented by What If. What If has you covered for accommodation, flights, car hire and more. So if you're looking for a holiday, travelling for business or you need to get to the game, visit whatif.com slash Rabbitohs. What If, it's Aussie for travel. My name's Jeremy Monaghan. I'm the Rabbitohs Media Manager. To my right is the legendary Shannon Donato and in front of us on the screen is is uh, champion Mark Ellison. How are we, gentlemen? I'm well. It's great to see hello. Thankfully, we got wide screens here at TCL, so it's great to see <laughs> great to see you, hello. You're looking a picture of health, and uh, it's just great to have another another show on. Oh, it's great to see you two guys too. I mean, it's it's a lot more freedom here in the bubble, not being squashed between you two fat <laughs> <that's> for sure. <laughs> Oh, ding, very ding, it good. started early. Jeez, hasn't it? What? <laughs> hasn't it? What? Oh, it's well, very vicious yeah. this morning. I've had, I've had plenty of time to think, waiting for you guys to get ready for it. So let's get <laughs> on with it, eh? <laughs> Righto. We'll get into it. Something we've learnt this week. We'll start with you, Ella. I learnt that when you change, when you haven't got seven of your top line players in, it makes a difference to your, your team in the NRL. I mean, we're going along very well, seven wins in a row. Uh, we turned the corner, unfortunately, very quickly and, um, you know, uh, looking for answers is a little bit difficult this week, but um, I'm sure Wayne will get the boys to bounce back this week and uh, be a tough game against Cronulla, coming off a, a similar sort of game as we've had. So, um, yeah, looking forward to the weekend. Hello. A few people have asked me um, what Wayne said to the boys after the game. Like, it's a 50 nil loss, it's a tough loss and... You know, Wayne's a bit of an enigma, so I guess everybody's a little bit curious. What, are you happy to share what you can share of what Wayne said to the boys after the game? Oh, I just, you know, I, I'm not going to say word for word, but, you know, just along the lines of everyone having a look at themselves and see where they can improve, improve for next week. We knew it was going to be we knew it was going to be a difficult game, there's no doubt. I mean, they were last year's premiers. Um, they were magnificent with their ball control. And we were probably had our worst ball control of the season. Um, so it's just areas that we need to improve in. Um, you know, it, it's not acceptable getting beat 50 nil. I mean, at the Rabbitohs, we all know that. Um, and, you know, everyone involved in the place, you know, the staff and players were feeling it after the game. Um, but you know, like everything, a week's a long time in football, but... Um, We've got to get back and we've got to, you know, show our, our members and ourselves that we're, we're better than what we showed last week and I'm sure we will. Absolutely. Shannon, what have you learnt this week? Well, on a brighter note, Jez, I learnt just what a good day it is at uh, the Iron Mark High Performance Centre at Redfern Oval. We had the, You've uh, been copying my notes. Oh, really? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We should uh, we should collaborate a bit more before we come well, on the yeah. Well, he's close enough to see him now. He's <laughs> like sitting next to your school. That's, that's how we got through school, Jez. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that, Jez. I ate sorry. your sandwich before too when you were uh, looking. But, <laughs> no, it is. You know, all three grades out there. The sun was shining. We had... Cold young Henrys, hot Garlos, it was just uh, living the dream. Yeah, it was. It was a great uh, afternoon out there and it was. Um, I was doing some grand announcing alongside a new gem that we discovered in uh, in Bronte Fulton. She had her first crack at grand announcing the women's game, and it was good fun to be back at Redfern Oval and uh, talking to the faithful there because they really are the hardcore Rabbitohs members and supporters that are that were there supporting the team. And surprisingly, there was quite a few Manly fans as well. I think there was more than than there are at uh, Brookvale each week. Yeah, I think they heard there was a Fulton announcing and they <laughs> they got a little bit confused. But Bronte's no relation, I don't think, to, to the great Bozo. But you're right, she did she did a great uh, job and everybody was in great spirits and it was just a, a fantastic day. And um, 
the the young fella to come off the bench in the um, knockout effect cup. Uh, the Greek fella, I can't remember his name, but he was he was Ar- Aristeli Tatakotankatos or that, something. That, that's the man. He yeah. was he was outstanding. Something and, about Tosser or something <laughs> at the end of his name. For those of you who don't know, Telly works in our uh, sponsorship <laughs> team. He's uh, finished his degree, did a traineeship with us, worked all the way through uh, to up his rank up the ranks in the sponsorship department. But was a was a great junior rep football player and made his comeback this year. Trained his guts out for the last six months and uh, it was a pleasure to see him get a run with the um, with the Knockout Effect Cup team. It was. It was good to see him get on there and an interesting story on that because I was thinking about isn't it great to see the bloke from the office get out there and, and have a crack and then I thought back to um, one of the digital guys who used to work with us, Lars Roy. He's recently left the Rabbitohs and he's gone over to the New South Wales Waratahs where he, he um, got up into a higher ranking job within their digital That's team. That's a good and move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it gets better, Ello. So oh, okay. he, t- he told he told the rest of our digital team, "You'll never believe it, but they're going to give me a run at training. They're short on a few numbers, and they're going to give me a, a run at training." Because Lars had um, played one trial match of under twenties footy for for South, and he played some A grade, so it wasn't like he was a nuffy. But the problem was, he went and put the footage of his training session up on his Instagram account, and here he was absolutely carving the Waratahs up. Oh, was he? And he was quite <laughs> proud of himself on Instagram, and I, I wrote a and I said, what a way to build confidence in a team that hasn't won a game all year. Get the media bloke to carve you up at training. So I'm just waiting if you can make it happen, Ella, if you can get me out there at training, if you can talk to Wayne, I'm ready to take on our forward pack. I'd like to see that. (laughs) And then I'll be having the next two weeks off. I'm sure they're ready to take you on too, Jess. (laughs) I'll be having the next two weeks off. I'll just line... Oh, you line it up with Wayne, I'll line up the two weeks off with Blake. Uh, So our first top four... uh, Topic for this week, the top four naturally talented players that you've seen in the game. We'll start with you, Ella. I go back a fair while, Jez, to when I was uh, just a young kid. I used to watch, um, you know, the, the Roosters under Jack Gibson had a great team in the early 70s with Artie Beetson and, and players. Ron Coote was there from the Rabbitohs, obviously, and I used to follow them. But Russell Fairfax was the fullback. He'd come over from Rugby Union. Uh, he played for Australia, played for the Galloping Greens at Randwick. And, um, and played for South. This, played for South. Yeah, he did play for South as well yeah. as the Roosters. Uh, yeah, the, further at the end of his career. But he, he could do things that other players couldn't do. And, like, I remember him. He was the first guy I'd ever seen at fullback actually jump and leap into the air and catch the ball above the pack and things like that. Things he must have learned in rugby union mm. and things like that. But another, he used to have a great knack of – you know, doing flick passes when he was running across. These days they turn a ball under and they do it that way, but he had the great flick pass. I remember seeing one day at the Sydney Sports Ground, he ran across the field and he went to flick pass running to the sideline and he had nowhere to go and everyone's looking for the guy coming back under him, the winger, including the opposition winger, came inside and he hadn't passed it to him. He just dummy behind his back mm. and ran up the sideline and scored a try in the corner. It was one of the most amazing things mm. I'd ever seen. And that leads me into my second one. Well, just just uh, before you go on there, yes, Ello, he was very, very proud of playing for South Russell Fairfax. I think everyone remembers him for his time at the Roosters and also in Rugby Union, but he used to work with Fox Sports and Fox Sports News, so we'd see him quite regularly at training. And if he'd ring me up or something ahead of a, a game, he'd say, oh... Um, because on, on my voicemail, it says my member number, 1735, and he'd say, G'day, 1735, it's player number 672 here, or whatever his number yeah. was. He was he was very proud of, of having played first grade here at South, and it just shows you what this club means to people. Yeah, good on him. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to yeah, cut you yeah. off there, Elo. Back on no, he's story. a very gifted player. I see him, I see him occasionally at uh, our friends out at the Coast Golf Club. He plays golf out there regularly, so... I catch up with him now and again, and uh, he was a really, really good footballer. And another thing, he was never allowed into the Leeds club back in the day because he had the long hair. That's right. I remember be, that used story. To be, yeah. um, used to be rules that you had to have hair above your collar back in the day. So he he couldn't go back after matches and things like that. I remember that. Really what about Pappenhaus and what would they have said to, said to him back in the day? Hello? Oh, they wouldn't have caught him. Shannon, he'd have been in there before the, the bouncers could grab him. But no, he, he wouldn't have got in. He wouldn't what, have got in. What about so. Renault with his 68,000 tattoos? Would they have let him in? <laughs> yeah, he'd have got it. 
it it had got in. It, they were a disguise for him to get in. No, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> no, but, Very good. Um, an- another player who did a similar thing in a grand final as what Russell Fairfax did that day was was Brett Kenny when they were playing that grand final in the early 80s against Newtown. And he ran down the sideline and poor old Phil Sigsworth, he dumbed it inside and then went down and scored down the sideline. Uh, you know, he just had remarkable skill in that area. He was very quick, but he could get again do things with the football that that others couldn't do. Um, but then, uh, you know, one of the greatest that I would say is Greg Inglis. You know, he just had a remark, remarkable gifts and, you know, he could fend across his body. Um, I remember, I think I've spoken about uh, a tackle he made back in 2012 against Newcastle on that, uh, what was his name, the winger, uh, Uate. Oh, yeah, Akilu was, was Uate. That, that was an tomorrow. unbelievable tackle. He it was, it was 18 6. He was in a school in the corner. He just stopped him dead in his tracks and took the football off him at full speed and and got tackled just in front of the trial on himself. And um, that try scored, again, the one. The try scored up in Brisbane in 2014 against the Broncos. The first one ever to flick the ball back over his head in a, you know, for a try in front of the members' stand at the creek ground, the centenary test. Um, just uh, a remarkable athlete that could make something out of nothing. And then you'd watch him running freely. He was one of the great sights in rugby league when he got in the clear. Um, you know, and let's hope he does a bit more with Warrington now over there. So he's had, he's had a fair start over there. Um, and I've got two more. Sorry, that's three. But two more just in our, in our current team, Latrell and Cody. They, um, they've they got remarkable skills and, and flair. Sorry, you, you're all gone. Just Shout ticking mine off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's like one, going to bingo one, over here. <laughs> one, like Cody and Luttrell have the ability to play backyard football as well as the ability to play structured football, mm. which in the modern game is not, you know, not everyone can do, not many can do. And I've been watching what they do very closely. And, you know, now Cody's at fullback with Luttrell out and when yeah, Luttrell's in, they've both got a great catch and pass under pressure, you know, and, and these days you see most players in their position want to throw torpedo passes, whereas the, those just catch and pass in a traditional football pass, you know. Um, and, you know, they can just do things others can't. They're very, very gifted. Mm. So that's uh, yeah. five. Sorry. Five, five very good ones too, Willow. What about you, Shannon? They, they were very good ones. They were just all naturals and... Natural football players just born with it, and there's not many of us around really. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed I didn't get a mention, hello, but that's okay. Um, actually, speaking about Brett Kenny, he was he could sell dummies, he used to sell more dummies than the local chemist. He was he was very skillful. <laughs> the, the, the great Do you buy a few? <laughs> <laughs> You've been spinning them for the last eight weeks, hello, I need some more ones. <laughs> um, my my four, you know, naturally talented players are a bit closer to home, ones I've either played with or or, or at least worked with. And uh, the first one is Craig Wing. He's just a really naturally well-balanced runner. He had a great uh, kicking game, could put guys through. His passing game was extraordinary. I remember when he came up to um, first grade at South and I remember the, the, the boys, the decoy runners, kept stuffing it up. And I remember him curving a pass around a decoy runner to hit the second man in, in front of him. And I thought, there's not many blokes that can do that, just Craig and I. And he was just an absolute <laughs> um, <laughs> freak of a, freak of a Jeez, player. He'd have had a job curving it around you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was more the gravitational pull that pulled, <laughs> pulled the ball around me. The ball couple. went into orbit. <laughs> <laughs> There's still a couple must, of moons he'd around be the there. He's most somewhere. naturally gifted of all time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I'm glad you're in the bubble, Ella. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, Wingy's an absolute freak and a, and a great guy off the field as well. Um, Ella mentioned Trell, which Latrell is absolutely amazing, but I had the pleasure of playing with his old man, Matty, as well. And Matty played lower grades here and was no doubt could have been a first grader and probably a representative player, but got homesick. But Matty, he could step off both feet um, 
he was amazing. He he'd also uh, again had a great passing game and just uh, it was a bit like a Cody Walker in terms of he was an instinctive player. Um, he just played what he saw in front of him, but he could get his side around the park as well. And for a, having a nuffy of a dummy half like me, it sort of made my <laughs> life a lot easier knowing I had a bloke like Matty Mitchell outside me. He was just a fantastic player. Um, we had some, you know, in the great halves, he played with Duncan McRae, who went on to play for the Waratahs, who you mentioned earlier, the Tars. And, um, you know, Matty and Duncan came out of that same Matraville side and they were they were very strong, but uh, not strong enough to beat the mighty Kenzo boys <laughs> that year, which was... I like to remind Matty of every time I see him, but yeah. Did uh, you sorry. have a year off that year? Did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I'd give him a chance. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm a bit excited today. I'm going to sit next to you, so it's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I miss you too, Ella. <laughs> like a toothache. Um. <laughs> I bet you the Chinese restaurant's missing you too. <laughs> <laughs> They've actually gone on holiday. So. <laughs> uh, another one in terms of instinctive uh, players, Tricky Trindle. Um, just had a bit of everything. Uh, could run, chip and chase. Uh, could do absolutely anything and anything. And sometimes, you know, it would be an outrageous play, like a chip from his 20, but invariably he'd get the ball back and... Um, you know, we talk about that side that won the uh, two inch challenge. I think it was in 1994. 94, it was. 4th of March, 1994. Yeah, was it? Yeah. My 17th birthday. Down in Lovington and. Lovington um, Sports Over Against Aubrey. the Broncos, was Against it? Against the Broncos. They were wearing the diamond jersey. That's right. Wayne, yeah. very unhappy that night. Yeah, well, I'm sure he was <laughs> happy at Triggy because Triggy, Triggy slayed him all the way through that series and he was instrumental in the uh, side winning that. And uh, He's got two boys that are both fantastic footballers and uh, Jake, his youngest, is carving them up for um, Matto, I think, in the local A grade as well. So it's good to see that DNA get passed on. So we spoke about Wingy, Matty Mitchell, Triggy Trindle and uh, a, a guy I've known for, for a very long time is um, Craig Field. He was just tiny. He was like... He was smaller, I reckon, than Preston Campbell, and um, just like Preston, he dodged in and out, and uh, he was, you know, he he just grew up with a footy in his hand and was always playing footy. His old man Mick was a very good footballer, and Craig uh, was great, and he came on to play lots of first grade games for the Rabbitohs, um, local boy, and then um, went over to Manly. I think he might have won a comp or two over there at Manly, but. But uh, always at heart, a South Sydney boy, Craig, and uh, played in the red and green uh, growing up as well in the under sixes and sevens at um, Paddington Colts originally in the East Comp and then come across to the South Comp. But Craig Fields, Tricky Trindle, Matty Mitchell and Craig Wing, all uh, sublime and naturally gifted footballers. Very, very good. Well, I've uh, got two to add. I had GI and, and Latrell um, in my list. I had John Sutton as well. I always used to call him... The magician, there were things that he could do on a footy field that were just innate. They were just built into him. And I don't reckon there's anyone that I've ever seen that can read a game better than John Sutton could when he was on the field. He just knew what was going to happen two and three plays ahead, um, whether we had the ball or we didn't. And he was just a fantastic player. And a lot of people talk about Latrell and compare him to GI, but I see so much of Sutto in Trell. Yep. Trell, to me, is a he's a triple threat. He's got the power, the pace, and he's got the deft touch. And Sutto probably had the power and the deft touch. He didn't have the pace. GI probably had the power and the pace and not necessarily used his deft touch as much as he could, or, though yep. he had it. He had the passing game. But some of the stuff that, that Trell can do is just a mixture of both of them. And, and I see a lot of Sutto in, in Trell, and I'm sure working with Sutto on a regular basis, training with the first grade team as, as Sutto does, I'm sure that, that helps Trell with his game. Yep. Um, I think that's, I think, Jez, if I can just jump in, that's a really good call. I mean, in, in all the years I've been back at CS as a player and coaching, and in what I do now, I think, I think John's uh, got the best football brain of, of any player that I, I either played with or coached or watched. Um, as you say, he wasn't quite as quick as some of the others, but, um, you know, he could engage the opposition in, you know, you know he just, he'd just tell them lies with the football, you know, and they'd, they'd just cop them, you know. He'd just he'd deceive them and, and they'd just fall in on him, you know. And, yeah, he, he very talented and 
It was remiss of me missing him, to be fair. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's why I call him the magician. It's like yeah. illusions. He's out there doing <laughs> things with the ball and just pulls the football out of his hat, you know? Like, it just they didn't yeah. know what was going on. It well, was, you know, that that was actually Ello's nickname when he played footy too. The magician, he used to disappear every time it was time to tackle. But <laughs> <laughs> and he, tried to, he actually, he's still the magician. He, he disappears any time to pay the bill, actually. That's a, I reckon here at the juniors, he's a triple threat. He eats lots, he drinks lots, and he disappears when it's time to pay the bill. He's the ultimate triple did, triple threat. Did you, Jeremy, he's read that off his notes. He has. Oh my god! I think he wrote that last night. Oh, well, nah, he he'd have got someone else to write. Uh, it's, not that quick. it's a gift, hello. What can I say? I cracked me up. There's a gift from someone else. Oh, very good. And my final one. He, he's a rabbit o, but probably didn't play his his finest football at South. More known for his work at the Sharks, and it's David Peachy. Um. One of the best sights in rugby league was seeing Peach stretch out, and I hated it when he was playing for the Sharks against South, but I loved it when he was playing for South against anyone else. And just those big, long, skinny legs and the big, long arms, and he'd carry the ball in two hands until he got into space, and he'd tuck it under, and he'd just stride out. And for everyone else's stride that covered one and a half, two metres, he was covering three or four and just loping up the field. No one was going to catch him. And he was just sublimely talented, and it was a real pleasure to get the opportunity to work with him because he was a. When he came to us, he was a, a senior statesman of the game and a very important person within the Indigenous community. And I learnt a lot off Peach, um, not only in terms of football, but in terms of just as a bloke as well and his background. And but talented, there weren't many better. Yeah, you're right. He was. In full flight, he was absolutely magic to watch. And he could just create things out of nothing. You'd see set defensive lines just coming straight out. And you think, oh, Peach is going to get snapped here. Because he was a bit rangy and he mm. was built like a minute to six. But you think, and then all of a sudden he'd snap and, and yeah. he'd get his way through them. He was uh, he was great to watch the Peach. Yeah, I loved it. The, the Sharks had told him, whether they told him or whether they'd said publicly that they thought he was too old and had to, to move on. And then we played the Sharks at Shark Park and he was playing for us and... He carved us up and he carved them up, sorry. And when he was doing his interviews after the game, he pulled up his South jersey and underneath he had his skins on under it had written on it, never too old. Oh, good, <laughs> on good on him. Good on him. <laughs> it was really good. So, uh, yeah, really enjoyed working with the Peach and uh, he's a great fella and, and what a footballer. So, some great, uh, very naturally talented footballers in, in that list. And I'm sure there were many others that we, we could have mentioned as well, but some, some great footballers in that lot. So. Indeed there were. And yeah. I'm- very good, and, and none of us mentioned yourself or Ella. <laughs> it was natural footballers. Ella's a natural, lots of things. <laughs> but I won't, I won't go down that dark, dirty road. I'll give you the tip. <laughs> oh, very good. Righto, we will be back in a moment. Now, the official Rabbitohs merchandise store, it's now located down at the Heffron Park Tennis Centre on Bunurong Road in Maroubra. And all the new gear keeps coming in week after week. And if you can't get down to uh, to Maroubra to Heffron Park, you can also shop online at shop.rabbitohs.com.au. And what's in store this week? Well, the Indigenous jerseys are going like hotcakes again. So uh, we'll be playing in them in a couple of weeks. And uh, we all know the story behind it now, of course, representing the two local Indigenous mobs that the traditional Rabbitohs territory uh, covers. So a great story as well as a great piece of art in those jerseys. So they're selling really well. And just want to remind everybody that why it's so important to shop with the club. And that's because your profits and your money stays with keeping our club strong and allowing us to do what we do with the team but also in the community through South Cares and those programs. Mm. You shop with Rebel and the retail margin goes into some shareholders' pocket. You shop with the Rabbitohs and your money stays with the club. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of that jersey and, and the story that it tells about where we play, but it's also got a great tie-in to South Cares with the students that helped design it with Uncle Joe Walker. That's right, local kids from, from local mobs and learning about their history and their culture as, as well as designing the jersey. And that's mm. how the Indigenous people pass down their tradition mm. and their stories is, is, is through works of art and through stories and, and that's really well represented in our jersey. Yeah, and we always see the boys, Ello, when we play in it, they always step up the level of intensity and they want to represent that jersey with even more pride than they, than they do each week. 
Well, I, I think our yeah, club, uh, you know, we're synonymous with that, with Indigenous culture and, and multiculturalism. And, you know, the boys wear it proudly and, and every time we play that they're at their best, which is great. And everyone knows, everyone knows that we uh, are an Indigenous club and we've had some great Indigenous players throughout our history and we have now. And, you know, they're just part of the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Absolutely, yes. So jump on line at shop.rabbitos.com.au or head down to the Heffron Park Tennis Centre on Bunurong Road in Maroubra and grab your gear today. Now, our next top four topic is the top four favourite parts of your job. And I've got to say, I had to spend a bit of time on this because... I had to cut it down. <laughs> yes, yeah. it sort of it made me really appreciate how fun parts of of my job are, and um, not to take these things. I think we've talked about it on previous episodes on not taking these things for granted because we do get afforded opportunities to to do certain things, meet certain people, and work with people that that other people would kill for that opportunity to uh, to do. And so it was it was good fun um, narrowing this down to to four. I, I managed to narrow it down to four. We'll see if. You and Ella were able to narrow it down to four. We'll start with you, Shannon. Well, Jez, you're, you're always such a gentleman. You always start with us. And why don't we start with you All right. this week? I'm happy to start. You okay with that, Ella? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very you, you're good. All right. <laughs> Sorry to wake you up, Ella. All right. My first one is the five minutes before kickoff. Now, I'm lucky enough to be the grand announcer at our home games, which means I get the the honour of standing out in the middle of the field just before the team is about to run out. And generally when we've got crowds, twenty to 30,000 people, they're all there waiting for the team to come out. And it's, it's my job to get them up to fever pitch when that team runs out on the field so that when the boys hit the end of the tunnel, they get that final push and burst as they come out for kickoff. And so I take that pretty seriously, but it's also one of the most fun parts of my job and... Back in 2013, we played the Roosters in the final round and I had the chance to grand announce that game in front of 59,000 people and yeah. that is one of the absolute highlights of my working career. What a buzz. Just the atmosphere and the buzz, I tell you. Look, I don't get nervous about it anymore because um, I've done it for so long now. It's been 15 years or something that I've been doing it. But at a, on event days like that, it is an absolute rush. Like I've yep. I've skydived, I've jumped from however many thousand feet free fall and for nearly a minute and tried to take one of Ello's chips and tried to th- take got a all the slap on the wrist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there that's one of the, the biggest buzzers and 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 out at ANZ Stadium people um well not ANZ Stadium anymore, sorry, Stadium Australia, people criticize that ground because of how immense it is and how and how big it is, and they say you can't build an atmosphere there with small crowds. But let me tell you, standing um, on that Telstra Premiership logo, about ten metres from the sideline, and all of our members on that western side of the field in all those bays, and then you turn around to the eastern side, and we've got all our members in the middle bays over there, and then you look over to the far right, and there's a, a, about six or seven Roosters fans cheering their team as they come out. <laughs> And then we've got 25,000, 30,000 yes. people. That, and then when I say been. Rabbitohs members and supporters, get on your feet and you see people rise to their feet, it's just, oh, it's giving me chills now. Yeah, I love you, it. You, you do. Said, <laughs> you do yes, such a good yes, job. You, you said seven, um, seven Roosters fan. You must have had double vision when you were looking at there might have been a couple of Queenslanders in there with two heads. <laughs> yeah, all the Roosters scenes, both of them. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, Jez, you know, just talking about that, yeah, you know, I could feel the goosebumps too. Also, you, you would have seen lots of players come through. Like, you see them come into the system and, you know, you would have saw them from, you know, SG Ball, Pathways into, mm. might have been the old NYC, whatever it is, to see them mm. come out on, and, and often, you know, through injuries and, and whatnot, and see them finally make their NRL debut. Do you do you ever get a little bit of a, a, a or, you know a milestone game? Oh, or? big time! When when Sutto played his two fiftieth, we're up in Cairns, I think it was. Yes, and I nearly teared up. Yep. I was that close because 
I'd seen Sutto from his debut. I'd seen him come all the way through. He's running out with his kids in his arms, and poor old Katie Staniforth, who used to work here, the, the banner didn't break for Sutto, so yes. she had to go and bust it open <laughs> with, her, with her hands because the banner didn't break because he had his arms full of kids. He's a hard man, that Sutto. But, uh, <laughs> his arms were full of kids. But... Just announcing him out and saying he's coming out with Pippi and Ace and all that sort of stuff, like I started to get all emotional about it. And it, it's interesting when you watch the different players run out. So Cody Walker runs out in his stony face. You can see that he's got his game face on. He's ready, he's ready to go. But a few weeks ago, we had our family round, and um, I was lucky enough to have my daughter come out and stand with me the way that the, the players' partners and had their kids with them in the Guard of Honour. As they ran out, Renault led the team out, and Renault's just so calm. He runs out. He was running off to the side. He saw Kira because he knows Kira through soccer because his son and my daughter play at the same soccer club. So okay. he comes and sees us every Saturday and has a chat to her. Anyway, he diverted back towards me and gives her a little tickle on the tummy oh, good as, on. as he ran out. And yeah. Whereas other blokes are just fixated on getting out there yeah. and they're all pumped up. Jaden Sue is similar to that. He's ready to go when he when he runs out. And Gag, Dane Gagai runs out and he's probably forgotten his mouth guard and one of his <laughs> socks and to tie up one of his shoelaces. That's yeah. just Gags. You know, Gags yeah. is a bit absent-minded with that sort of stuff. But it's just interesting seeing the way the different boys run out. And it's interesting seeing the opposition too. You can get a you can get a read on what the opposition are going to be like today, the way they run out. Like when the uh, when the we played the Tigers a few weeks ago, in the first half, James Roberts ran out and wouldn't make eye contact with me, and I'm I got quite close with Jimmy while he was at South. But the second yeah. half, it was almost like he wanted to come over and give me a cuddle. Yeah. You know, he was he was all business first half, second half. He'd obviously relaxed into the game and yep. had realised he was coming up against his old team and had that 40 minutes to get over it. And as he ran out, he's sort of smiling at me as he runs past me. Yeah. And some players do that. Some players absolutely ignore it. Heimel Hunt, he's the nicest, one of the nicest blokes you'll ever meet in rugby league. Yep. When he runs it on that field, he will not make eye contact with you because he's fixated on the job that he's got coming up and you know he switched on. Yeah, 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 absolutely. He just I remember that day well when all the players were there and their families were there mm. and watching how they react and Brock Schaefer, um, he's a new father. He's only short Brock and he had his beautiful daughter there. It was good to see Brock on his daughter's shoulders and enjoying the atmosphere. <laughs> it, was, uh, <laughs> it was fantastic to see him out there. So it was a great family day indeed. Oh, very good. <laughs> we need to tell Brock to listen at about 32 minutes into the podcast. <laughs> Love to start here in the family, Brock. <laughs> oh, very good. So that's the five minutes before kickoff. For me, another favourite part of my job is being there for the singing of the team song. Um, it was a little while until I was actually allowed into the rooms for when the team song was sung. And particularly under Madge, like Madge was very much a stickler for only the team in there, only the team in there. And eventually he let a few other people come in for it. But now that the broadcasters have to come in to film the team song and record the team song, that's part of my job now. Mm to get the camera in there, get the, the audio guy in there, make sure that all the other hangers-on don't come in because they always try and send in eight people for a two-person job yep. and uh, making sure that they come out. But just being in there and seeing the passion that the, the boys sing the song and the way Ello kicks it off, that's when we know that the uh, the door's about to open when Ello gets the, the song started. That's some of the most passionate moments in your, in your job is watching that team song and... I'll never forget the team song after the 2014 Grand Final. That was that was phenomenal. And then having the opportunity to go out onto Stadium Australia at 1am in the morning, whatever time it was, with the place absolutely empty and seeing them sing it again. And these are the things you can't take for granted because there's so many people that would love to be in there yeah. for, for those moments. And I remember you saying the other day, you don't miss a lot about footy, but it's little moments like that in the dressing rooms with your with your teammates is what you miss. It's yes. not the, the actual competition or the adrenaline rush, but it's those moments with your mates. So. Yeah, indeed. You can't replicate it in any other form of your life. No matter what you do at, at the elite sporting level, when there's so much pressure, so much focus on you, you know, when you go away and you might work in high pressured businesses, you might work in the media, whatever, but you'll never be able to replicate that sort of that atmosphere, that crucible that you're in. You know, mm. the two minute bell when it rings and you go out there, you know, it's like nothing else. Yeah, Ella, it must. Does it feel like an honour to you to kickstart that team song every week? Oh, of course it does, Jess. It's um, 
it's something that, that we used to sing when I played here. And, and, and when you come into the team, you, you, you don't sing it until you're a rabbiter and um, you get to know the words and it takes a while to get to know the words, particularly if you're not winning many games, you don't have to <laughs> sing it, obviously. But no, it's, it's still every time we sing it, I just, that's, that's one of the great parts of my job too, mm. Jez. I just, I feel like, you know, you're living parts of your life like that you have for such a long, long time. And mm. it's, um, it's just what the club does to you. Yeah, it's, it's a blessing. <laughs> so, Elo, just talking about the song and just talking about how pumped up you are, can you give us a full rendition now, please, mate? Well, if you started off for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we'll spare all of our listeners that. Uh, I, I thought I got you for a second there. Uh, I thought it was a chance. Very <laughs> good. Silly, not Billy, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> No, Billy, not silly. Yeah, I was going to say, don't, don't bugger that one up, Ella. So the third favourite part of my job, and it's only been over the last two and a half years, are Wayne Bennett's press conferences. They are absolutely hilarious. They are. And I know how he works now. I know how he likes to structure it so that he, he takes control of, of a press conference. And it's funny, over the years, I get people saying to me, your, your job title is media manager, but you can't possibly manage the media. You can't control it. And in a lot of cases, you can't. You can't control how they report things or, or what they do. But I've never seen anybody do it better than Wayne. He yeah. just knows how to handle it. He knows how to put them a little bit off kilter if they're getting a little bit off topic. He knows how to not talk about something and bring in another topic so that they talk about that rather than what he doesn't want people talking about. And some of his responses are just absolutely hilarious. And I'll, I'll bring the curtains down a little bit. Wayne doesn't like people talking about him. But the, a couple of weeks ago, he had the journos in absolute knots. He tied them in knots at a press conference we did at Erskineville. And every after every um, press conference, I walk away with him and he goes, was that all right? And I'll say, yep, spot on, all good. Or I'll say, I think this will come out of it. Or no, I think you nailed that. And we walked into the sheds at Urco and he said, was that all right? And I said, yep. And he said, I said, yeah, that was hilarious. And he says, you're going to miss my press conferences next year, aren't you, mate? I said, no, I'm just going to ring you every Friday and have one with you. I'm just going to do my own one with you. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have a bit of a laugh every week. He does love the torture of them, doesn't he? You know, you see them. He does. They are something he's not happy with and he just... But it's not just his press conferences. We'll go back to Bro- Brock Schaefer again. Yes. I remember Brock had to yes. interview him for a, for a corporate function once. Yeah. And Brock had this long-winded first question which delved into a few different different things about the psyche of a coach or something. <laughs> and Wayne's response was, yep. <laughs> it, just put, it just puts them off. Yes. They go and ask these questions at the start and Wayne will give a couple of one-word one answers. Yes. And it puts, they don't know what to do after that. Yeah. You know, right. it's just, it's hilarious. To, and it's all for his own entertainment. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> That's the thing we've mentioned before, and Ella could probably testify to it more than anybody who spends uh, as much time as anyone in the club with, with Wayne. He's he's actually got a really, really good sense of humour, really dry sense of humour. Uh, it must be uh, interesting for you, for you working with him, Ella, because Wayne's actually funny. Oh, he is. He's, he's, he's definitely not the person... That most people see behind the behind the microphone. But some <laughs> days, Jez, before he goes to a press conference, he says, "Hello, well, I might have a bit of fun with these guys." But <laughs> <laughs> That's so it's, like a bully with so a magnifying <laughs> glass on the ends, you know. <laughs> oh, but, it's good uh, fun. Well, he's no, but as I've said a number of times before, you you walk past a team meeting, you know, when the boys are going through a review or a preview of a game, and there's always laughter in there and they're having a good time. And, yeah, he creates all that, mate. They, they just he's, – he's, he's, he's a very funny guy and he's, uh, he, knows, yeah, he, he knows how to motivate God, men, as we know, but, but he knows how to get them together as good friends as well. Yeah. So I but, love uh, that story a, about him doing the video session and uh, a player who hadn't had a particularly good game and he was mispronouncing his name and, and – 
all the players would have a giggle thinking um, Wayne, you know, was doing it by accident. Uh, he does the Colombo act very well, Wayne, you know, and he <laughs> keeps mispronouncing the guy's name. They all giggle. He's like, what are you laughing at? And they said, well, his name's not this, his name's that. And they pronounce it correctly. And he said, well, when he makes his tackles, that's when I'll start pronouncing his name properly. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. It's very good. I love it. So that, that's one of the highlights of my week too, the, the couple of press conferences that Wayne does each week. And my final one's getting to hang out with you blokes a bit more with recording this podcast. Over the last three months, it's become a real highlight of my week and it's good to um, listen to the old stories and think back on players that you might have forgotten about over the the years. And um, I remember sitting down in the off-season thinking, right, we're going to do this podcast. Rather than coming up with all the topics each week and stressing about that, I'm going to do it all now. And I just sat down and started typing. And after about an hour, I had over 100 topics Really? For us to talk about. And even now, like, I'll just be driving the car. I think, oh, that'll be a good topic. Yep. And I'll just email it to myself when I stop driving and add it to the list. And there's well over 100 topics for us to go through. So to all the uh, members listening, we're going to be doing this show for a few years <laughs> yet. <laughs> so I've got a few Actually, comments got, on that. I've got one next week for Shannon. Jez, it's the top four yum char dishes. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to be narrow, be able to narrow that down to four, no, Ella. No, no, no. That's going to be a serial, that one. That's going to be a mini-series. Uh, very good. Well, we have a good laugh on this show, and I think our listeners appreciate that we do have a laugh and that it's not all serious, and um, the hour that we get to spend together to do this is a real highlight of the week. So. It is, and that's, that's very nice words you to say, Jez, that this has become a highlight of your life. It's in the top four. I just got to say, uh, you, you need to get... Something else going on in your life. Man, can, how does this get in your top four? That's it. It's like pulling teeth, spending an hour with Ella. Oh. Man, it would give Penadol a headache, honestly. Some of the journos that I have to talk to, mate, oh, you'd know why did, oh. working with you two blokes for an hour is a highlight. <laughs> you did say, talk a glass eye to sleep, Ella. He just goes and goes. And, holy dearly. Oh, very good. Right over to you, Shannon. Over to me. Um, no, I'll the, go next, Jez. All oh, right, oh, over there. Yellow, yellow's pulled rank. I no, like no, it. No, 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 he can go. He can go. Right, he can you, talk Mark. his dribble. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, I'm going to talk about the sort of four four areas of my job. I guess almost four departments that I'm responsible for. Because I just thought I'd pick a highlight out of each one. As as you said, Jez, I you, you know I could have spoke about 60 highlights and we're not just giving up lip service we really do feel on it you know mm. blessed to to do something you love and you're passionate about and get get paid for it and it's your livelihood it's just a, it's an absolute blessing but I, I chose four different departments one from each of the departments and the first one sponsorship and one of the things I love working with sponsors it's a real privilege to you know we've got over you know, a hundred sponsors, and particularly our top tier sponsors. You know, they're paying, you know, hundreds, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. We've probably got about twenty of those, and just it's really interesting to see how different businesses work, and and the different machinations and dynamics between them, different strategies and different focuses and objectives. I find that really interesting, and mm. I see as part of our role is to help them meet their business objectives through the mm. partnerships and just understanding their business so that we can help them. You know, I always say to our team, we're in the solutions business. They're They've got some objectives and we've got to help them with solutions to meet those objectives. And I find that really, really interesting. And just getting a, a, a broad cross-section of different businesses is mm. really enjoyable and, and, as I said, interesting. Um, match days, as you said, Jez, the, the match days, just the atmosphere and the fun and the noise and just the whole theatre of it. It's, just, it's You know, I remember telling a friend who's really into the arts and she said, I'd, you know, sport wasn't a thing and... Uh, I, I told her, the thing about sport, it's unscripted theatre. Mm. It's absolutely unscripted theatre. People have put their whole life to get to this moment and put their work for 20 years to get to this moment and it's all decided in 80 minutes, you know, and it might be grand final night or otherwise, but, you know, they've put their life on the line and dedicated their life to this and there's tragedy and there's heroics and there's everything in between. There's sorrow and there's gladness, but I just, I just love the love the theatre of it all and the atmosphere and mm. the noise the smells everything about match days um, so then I want to talk about I guess another department is membership and you know working with our members and the passion they have for the club you know in many instances it's the main thing in their life they they, they love the club as much as they love their family and in fact they see 
fellow members as part of their family mm. and that's a really unique thing too you know and I, to, be, to be a part of nurturing and supporting that is a, is a real honour and mm. um you know, the unwavering faith and commitment they have to the club is actually quite inspiring. So um, that's membership. And then I just talk more broadly about that across the whole business is the sense of camaraderie. Mm. Um, you know, we spoke about it before with, you know, Charlie the Rabbit or Reggie the Rabbit and, you know, with the players and, and our, you know, our members, our football department and our administration department, we're all just one team. And I, I think that not every NRL club is like that. Mm. And not every sporting club is like that. But we're all just one pushing in the one direction. And that sense of camaraderie, and that's not to say like any siblings, we don't have disagreements. And, so you know, someone has a you know difference of opinion in one thing or another, which is fine and healthy. But ultimately, we're all pushing in the one direction. So that sense of camaraderie and how tight we are here is uncommon for a workplace. And I know we're not a workplace, we're a club. But, you know, to work in a place and a club like that that has such a unique sense of identity and camaraderie, I just love it. So they're the, they're the four great things you, I You can't I win without job. it. No. I know the, uh, the ultimate goal is to get the two competition points on the field, and I'm, I'm absolutely adamant from the success that we've had over the past decade that you cannot win football games without everyone pushing in the one direction. You just can't. It just doesn't work. Yep, spot on. And it's just so important. The other thing, there's a great saying, and I truly believe this, because, you know, without wanting to get arrogant and boastful, you know, in pretty much any metric you want to measure an NRL club, we're number one, whether it's membership, merchandise sales, ratings, digital traffic, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but I don't think it's because our strategy is better than anybody else. I think a big part of it is just our culture as a club. Yeah. And there's a there's an old saying that our culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm. And I think that's us. I think we've got a good strategy, don't get me wrong. We've got a great strategic plan, great operational plan. We've got great budgets and KPIs for the year across various departments. But it's not that strategy that makes us great. It's our culture that makes mm. us great. And um, so that camaraderie, uh, you know, sort of feeds into that into that culture yeah. so you know being part of that is one of the one yeah. of the great pleasures of, of my job yeah one of the, the good things about our place I think is that you can be honest with people yep and you can tell them how you feel or how you think about something and whether they dismiss that or not it's up to them but yep. I think everyone sort of feels that they can be honest and upfront with people and, and that goes down to the culture that people aren't scared to express their true feelings or a thought on something or an idea they've had and whether it's a bad idea or a good idea it gets discussed and either implemented or dismissed but um, to be able to be honest with each other at all times I think is so important and and you can just see it some some other places that are struggling that that's not the case. You can see that people tell others what they want to hear mm. and and how it works, and it just doesn't work. You've just yeah. un unless everyone wants the same goals and are willing to do what they can do to make it happen, you're not going to win. No, that's groupthink. You know, it can be a dangerous thing and send you right down the wrong yeah. track. Whereas if you're t constantly testing each other in a respectful way, yeah. constantly challenging and testing each other, you're going to keep each other honest all the way along. That's you it. know, whether it's your football department, your commercial departments, whatever it is. And that's got to start, that culture's got to start right at the very top. And, yep. you know, um, whether it be your CEO, your board, um, your investors, your coach, you know, mm. your head of football, head of media, you, as you want to, your most senior managers in the place, um, you know, the needs to start at the top and it permeates all the way through. And I think you're right; it's yeah. one of the one of the reasons why we have such a yeah. a great um, culture here. Yeah, big time. I think I think also like our culture is a byproduct of the people we have here. Yeah, that's that's the thing. And you talk about strategy. That's important, but if you haven't got the right people to put the strategies in place without the culture. Uh, I think that's what we we've got right here, and, and that's you know we continue to do that. We can we can continue to be pretty successful. I think that's it. This podcast yeah. would be very boring if you two weren't so honest with each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, LA just makes it so easy. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Honestly, sometimes I think he's setting me up. <laughs> <laughs> Very oh, good. Dear. All right, Ella, your top four parts of your job. Well, uh, the top part of my job is just having a look at the crowd in the stadium for five minutes after a game when we won. Uh, come back here in 2003, I remember 
my father, I spoke to him about coming back and getting involved in the club and he said, well, go and do it if you want to. And then part of the reason I wanted to do it was because, you know, I, I wanted to be part of everyone here trying to make a difference and get us better. And to sit there now and watch, watch after a game and watch the members applaud our team when we go over to them and, and have a look how the crowds have grown, you know, how uh, the players that we have in our team now compared to what we had back, you know, when we first came back into the comp and, you know, the success we've had and, the, you know, you know the, the consistency we're having is, is probably the most the favourite part of my job. That's the top one that I love because you get a feel that everyone's loving what's happening and that's what South's about. And I must say, though, even in the days when we weren't as successful, the crowd would still applaud us. You know, they'd never boo the players off. Even even the other night was one of our worst performances for a long, long time. But there was no one booing the players or anything like that. They knew it was just a one-off and we'll get it back on track. But that's that's the greatest thing that I can see because it, it sort of captures everything that the club has been about in trying to get back to where we are now. Um, and that's... Yeah, it's great. To, it's a great part of part of the job. Um, the second part of my job is watching players come through and watch them from a young age come through and become first graders and become representative players. You know, you go through the players over the years, like the John Sutton comes to mind, the Nathan Merritts, the the Bow Champions, the the Adam Reynolds. You know, the the you know all of them, the Cameron Murrays, the Campbell Grahams. Alex Johnson's. Mm. I mean, it's that's a great part of my job and just watching them not, not only grow as footballers and that, but, but grow as, as, as from kids to men and, you know, and watching watching them. Um, you know, I even, I even look at Sato now and Sato, is a, we all know, is a very nervous person in front of the camera and things like that. We do that Playmakers video now and you can just notice – you notice the difference in him, how more confident he is, and how he how he's grown in the role, and that's that's because he loves the club, and he wants to be part of it, and he wants to improve, and wants to get better, and that's that's what being part of this this club, you know, is about for me. Um, I remember when Sutter used to get dropped off at training by his mum because he didn't have his L's yet. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. and you look at him now, and he's got two kids of his own. He's got he got his own home, and yeah. he set himself up, and he's doing what he loves, yeah. and 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 he's got a career path ahead of him, and he's got him put into into what that career path's going to be. You, you're 100 percent right. Oh, that's a great part of of all our jobs yeah. is seeing these yeah. blokes come through and grow up. Yeah, the, you know, the, the other thing, um, it's just being part of rugby league. Still, you know, not only at the Rabbitohs, which is a bonus, but just being part of it, it's your job that you, 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 you know, you, you watch football, you help people get better, you know, you're part of help, help, you know, running the programs and that that need to be run at the place. You know, considering I started playing when I was five years old, like Shannon would have, and, you know, you'd have been involved since MGS, and, and just being able to still be part of it. Well, obviously, you know, you, you, you never want to give up playing when you've played, and Shannon could attest to that too. Yep. But now, now being still close to it, you just get your fix every week of football, mm. and, yep. and still, like you said, that five minutes before kick off when you go and you know read the team. Mine's game day still for me. Like you get there on game day, and it's still that ninety minutes before the game is as long as it is when you're a player, mm. you know, and pro- probably longer because. You know, you, you're not warming up like they do. You got you got your little jobs and that you do, but the, I think I think just that last five minutes, you're outside getting ready to announce the teams. We're inside on the clock. Shannon mentioned the two minute bell. I mean, you hear that go, and it's it's like it's like the bell for the boxers to go. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, you know, head to head, and away we go, and it's it's like it in there, and then yeah, and then you know, Renault will say how long to go. Well, I'll say oh, a minute. He'll call the boys in and have their last little speech, and away they go. And it's, you know, you, not many people get the chance to see that as close as close as you do. And it's it's something that, that that's outstanding, and it is a great part of the job. Um, Hello, and, can, yep. I, can I can yep. I just ask just about that because 
you know, you're really evoking what what the atmosphere is like. You're telling, describing it really well. Um, everyone's different in terms of how they feel at that point, but uh, you know, I've spoken to a couple of players. Myself was a bit like this, and in probably in my case, it was a bit unfounded. But I, you know, that sort of even the whole hour and a half going into the game, you sort of almost get yourself into a mental state where, you know, you feel invincible. Like you just think, I can't wait to get out there and rip into these blokes. I know we're going to put a hole in these blokes today. You know, you just, you, you, on game day, there's something in you, when you walk in there in a game day where you just got that arrogance maybe, I don't know how, how to actually describe it, supreme confidence that you, you're you going to go out there and you're going to dust them up today and it's something that's carried over from footy for me that even in the, in the stands when, you know, when I say I, I feel that sort of coming come, that feeling welling up in, inside me, do you, do you still have that with being so close to the yeah, boys? Yeah, I do, I do it, it's um, obviously we're all heavily invested and, and winning and losing is a massive part of our job as well as the players, you know, and, and um, you know, it's just it's just as important for us that we win as, as for the players because, you know, that the club runs better and, you know, we get obviously more sponsorship, more members want to be part of it, you know, and it's that's important. And and obviously you, you're out there and uh, you are ready to go. And probably one of the things I've learned over the years is to stay very calm, you know, in the job from that stage on, because that's when it's you know you, you know it's you know it's not not a great not a really important job. You got to make sure you get you get the messages out to the player or through Sato properly. The interchanges are right, you know, because if you stuff that up, it's it's you know it's no good. But like the players have to be calm. I mean, all of us have to do as well. You know, coaches, you know, the guys running the messages. It's 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 really. Um, yeah, when you you do get nervous, you do get nervous, you know, and and you but you got to just calm down and just get your job right, you know. Uh, it's funny you go back to there before games, Shannon. When 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 I left and went to St George, I was playing. I came back. My first game for St George was at North Sydney Oval, and I came late. It was when the draft was on anyway, and I was walking out to the warm up and um, and. Brian Smith was the coach. He said, how do you feel? I said, oh, I feel, feel probably more nervous than I have for, for many years, you know. He said, I'll tell you one thing. He said, I reckon the crowd out there, there's about 13,000 people in this oval out there and they'd all wish they could do what you were doing today. So yeah. forget about your nerves and just go out and do it. And it was one of the great things I do remember. And, you know, it was back in 1991, yep. you know, and, and you do have to. That's what I'm saying. When, you, when you're in these situations where we get ourselves now just before kickoff, and what you do, Jez, you know, there's not many people that get to do it, especially mm. for the Rabbitohs, mm. you know, and it's it's a, it's a great thing. It's interesting what you say there, Rillo, about players staying calm and everything, because I remember talking to you, Shannon, and you've been accused at times of being too good a bloke <laughs> 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 and being too soft, yeah. uh, particularly by Shane Richardson. Yeah. <laughs> But um, well, I remember that's you one saying, thing I've never said yes. Yeah. I've never accused him of that. I don't know if he was talking about his demeanour or his midriff, but um, <laughs> well, both. He was right on both counts, I think. But I remember you saying to me, you had to take yourself to another place in your head to be that aggressive on the football field and that sort of stuff. Did you? Where Ello's talking about players needing to be calm, were you able to maintain a, a level of being calm? while taking yourself to that different place in your head to not be nice Shannon Donato, you had to be aggressive Shannon Donato? Yeah, to be perfectly honest, I was just thinking, it's a really good question, Jez, because to be perfectly honest, I think it's why, you know, I wasn't in Ello's calibre because I, I wasn't. I mm. I was I was just all passion and I was just all, just all raw emotion and I was hyped up and I was super, like, just aggressive... Like literally wanted to put mm. a hole in blokes and run through walls, and mm. that's, you know, that's how I was. I I didn't. I was built that way. It's mm. not something I tried to do. It's just the way yeah. my I reacted to the adrenaline of game day. But I, I think back now, and I just wasn't able to think clearly. Oh, you know, um, I wasn't able to be a strategic, you know, player that get the team mm. around the park and those kind mm. of things because I was just I was obviously. My level of arousal was too high, but I couldn't do anything about it. It's just the way yeah. I was built. And it's not, to be honest, like, it's not something I'm really proud of and say, oh, I was, 
you know, this passionate guy, this tough man or whatever because um, I was very limiting in terms of what I was able to contribute to my team. It was just just made me a one dimensional sort of player, mm. I think. Mm. Yeah, I think it, I think you need I think you need that mix in the team though, Shannon. Mm. You know, I think I think you need that mix. And if you look at it in today's team or even back when, when we played, I mean it was um yeah, there, there were guys that probably were like you. You know, and that's that's a good thing. You need that as well. But you know, it, when I was playing I had more of a steering role or strategic role, you know, whereas yep. Yours wouldn't have been like quite like that, from what you say. No, and mm. to be honest, and maybe because they knew I was built that way, that's the job coaches wanted out of me anyway. Yeah, they just wanted to pull the hint, pin on the hand grenade, throw me yeah. out there, and just unsettle the other side or yeah. whatever. But I wish I, you know, did have that game sense and and whatnot. But I just got too caught up in it. Yeah. I couldn't. But I guess, I guess it is a horses for courses situation. Like you look at someone like a Nathan Cleary at the moment that's just starting his career, but he's obviously cool as a cucumber and nothing phases him and he just keeps his, his mind on the job and doesn't matter how many blokes hit him later or anything like that. And then you look at someone like Josh Reynolds that played for New South Wales, played in grand finals, had a great career, but was absolutely off his head. Yep. Like There's no other way to describe yep. the way he used to play. He was absolutely out of his head and I'm sure that's not how he was as a normal bloke yeah. and and sometimes he made errors and made mistakes but a lot of the time it was his passion and his hyperactivity that drove the rest of his team to play with aggression and, and get him going and as you say that's obviously what his coaches wanted out of him or yes. they wouldn't have been picking him in first grade. Yeah that's right Yeah, and that's probably why I wasn't picked in first grade <laughs> 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 Most of the time. <laughs> oh, very good. And so, <laughs> just just my last one, Jez, my, my fourth one, uh, what I love about the job is seeing um, different people in the community, you know, that have they've had tragic circumstances hit them and things that, that how our players, you know, not only through South Cares but off their own bat, mm. get to help people out. Um, it's, it's a thing that goes unnoticed in a lot of cases and we hear it you know all the time about why don't you tell some good stories about the NRL but they don't get put out there but when you see them firsthand it, it's very touching and it's it's great that it comes from our club and and a lot of it is not prompted from within the club it's yeah it's prompted by the players themselves and that's that's the most rewarding part for me well, two, two examples I can think of is just just recently I had no idea that this was happening but Latrell and Cody went out to Burke couple of weekends ago the day after a game and, and went out to Burke and went and did some um, coaching stuff with some kids and just running around with the kids out, out at Burke and that's not like they've just gone down to Matraville. Yep. Like they've actually had to make a real effort to yeah. get out there. I think they, they flew to Dubbo and drove to Burke Yeah. and did that off their own bat and they didn't mm. necessarily want publicity for it or come and tell us that they were doing it and can we can we talk about it on the website or promote it through South Kids. They just did that themselves. Yep. Another example is was GI. Now, GI used to do a lot of work in the Indigenous community um, and also through South Cares, but GI used to come in, and I don't think a lot of people knew this, and I didn't really know it until I shared an office with him over at Redfern Oval, and, and he'd come in with like a few bags of Rabbitohs gear, hats and old members stuff and all that sort of stuff. And I said, what are you doing with that, mate? And he said, oh, every month I go up to the children's hospital and just go and see the kids and hand it out. Wow. And no yeah. one knew. Yep. yep. No one knew that he did that stuff, but yep. he went up there off his own, own bat. He, he had enough, a humble man, GI, but he knew enough that him going up there and giving a kid a hat and giving him 10 minutes of his time and having a chat would lift their spirits and could help their recovery. Yeah, yeah, and something they remember for the rest of their life, and yeah. what it means to their fa those kids' families as yep. well. You know, they they kid they're the most vulnerable time in their life, yep. and you see your kid lying there sick, and I know that a, a man of GI stature yeah. comes up and give gives something of himself. It's, yeah, that's amazing. It's yeah. In a, in a similar vein, uh, a family LO and I know from from the local South Sydney area. Um, passed away um, over the weekend, and um, his kid was playing against mascot um, in the uh, under 16s on the weekend. And you know, to see those mascot boys who he's playing against, all with black armbands and a respect for him, and they had the minute silence. And there was about 50 or 60 local South Sydney families there support this young kid who just just lost his dad, and just what you know, football and the South Sydney district means to means to people that you're right it's an absolute pleasure to to be a part of yeah it's not just about how they can inspire them with their efforts on the field 
Yes, it's what they also do off the field, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they don't they don't look for publicity for it, and they don't they don't want um, the pats on the back for it. They do it because they know it can help someone, and that's important. And I'm sure it happens yeah. at at every club, and they're just a couple of examples that yep. that we've just come genuine, up with. I'm sure there's many more genuine acts of kindness without wanting reward for it. Yep, that that's exactly what it is, and it's, it's it. great to see. Yeah, well, there's my four, Jez. Very good, LA. Well, that was a. That was a great segment. We went, went off on a couple of tangents, yes. but they were good tangents to go off at uh, feel a bit warm and fuzzy. That's after actually, yeah, that. I felt lots of different emotions, actually. Yeah. Mm. You know, I could feel myself getting stirred up when we were speaking about the footy again. It was just I was waiting for you to put really, a head eye on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just shame Ella's not here, I can tell you. <laughs> Ella, you're lucky you're over Zoom, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't knock the skin off the custard, you say, uh, I don't <laughs> I've tried plenty of times, don't uh, <laughs> Very good. Righto, we will be back in a moment. Now, the Rabbitohs are back with home games for season 2021. That means you can get your corporate hospitality and your game day experiences going again once the COVID restrictions lift, which is hopefully um, before our next home game. We're yep. hoping the away game this week, but two home games in a row at Dubbo and then at Stadium Australia the, the two weekends after that. So make sure you ring Maddie or James and our corporate hospitality team here at the Rabbitohs, and they've got ho- hospitality options for everyone, whether you want to uh, entertain clients or you're looking to just have a night out with mates or have a bit of a family get together they they can sort something out for you and some of those VIP experiences are very special so make sure you contact Maddie and James on corporate.rabbitos.com.au and it's it is special some of those experiences once we get these COVID restrictions out of the way oh absolutely I mean first of all just being in the corporate areas whether it's the corporate lounges or your own uh, families or or employers corporate suite just being in such a special atmosphere being so well catered is is great in itself but then you know when we have the injured players coming in and saying hello and certainly you know to this day we'll continue to have our legends coming in and Mm. saying hello it's like nothing else it's a great way watching a Rabbitohs game is fantastic but it's a great way to put the icing on the cake there's also opportunities to see the team warm up before the game so you get to see a few of those emotions through the team that we were describing before and the parts of our job that we try not to take for granted and there's Often I see um, corporate people sitting in the players' enclosure yes. on game day. So there's all sorts of you're sitting right behind Ello as he's attacking the kickers when yes. uh, when they're about to kick the ball. Kicker, kicker, Cleary, kicker. <laughs> I see the knees start to wobble. <laughs> so there's plenty the of great experience. <laughs> Oh, very good. So there's plenty of uh, great experiences, so make sure you jump on corporate.rabbitos.com.au or give the club a call and ask for Matty Hutch or James Sutton and they will help you out with all your corporate hospitality needs. Now, a trivia question from last week. Benji Marshall became the most capped New Zealander in NRL history the week prior with 332 first-grade games. Who was it that he went past as the most capped New Zealander? And the hint is that he retired last year. Do you guys know the answer to this one? You can get that one, Shannon. I'll leave it to you, Ella. I'm a gentleman. No, you do it. You do it. <laughs> I can picture the guy. He's big forward. Um... Front he row, is. second row. He, um, he, 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 he was at the Broncos for a while. Then he, he went. He he finished off the at the Tigers. Warriors. Uh, yeah. He Are you talking about Ben Teo? No, 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 <laughs> not Ben Teo. But I've just had a mental blank on the fellas. It's not. Oh, camera. No. Oh, I give up, hello. It, it pains me to admit. <laughs> I'm having a mental blank myself. Oh, oh, very good. Just put us out of our misery, right please. The man's right. name is Adam Blair. Adam Blair. I was going to say oh, Cameron that's Blair. That's, that's not just right. my age. Adam that's not Blair. Right, Jess. Sorry? That's not right. That's yes. not right. Yes, it is. Hello, Jagger, mate. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> you should have seen your face. I was going to jump through that TV screen, Ella. You're having no, your second actually, guess. I was going to tell Shannon to jump through the TV screen. <laughs> 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 he was having a look at his face on the video. Uh, okay. You did good. what you did to the opposition kickers. You just put that bit of doubt in his mind, Ella. You very well played. I could just see he was 95% confident. Very good. The knees buckled for a second there. Uh, uh, very good. Right, oh, this week's trivia question now. We always talk about Rabbitohs Radio podcast and the man that drives the podcast, Steve Maven. He's one of the hosts, of course. How many first grade matches did Mavo play for the Rabbitohs and how many points did he score? Now, the, the hint is he scored more points than played first grade games for South. Right. We had a bit of time at uh, the Bulldogs as well. Um, over, but we're only interested in the Rabbitohs. We couldn't care less about the Bulldogs for this one. So well how many first grade matches did Steve Maven play for the Rabbitohs and how many points did he score? I'll let you guys uh, have a think about that and we'll come back with the answer next week. Have you got any clever comments there, Ella? You got the little grin on your face ready to <laughs> hammer Mavo? <laughs> No, I wasn't. That one at the SCG, did that count as... Did that one count as South or Canberra? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, what do I own goals count as? He's probably scored more points than the Bulldogs have this year. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, very good. I love you, mate. Cruel, but very good, yeah. We love you, brother. They're doing a great job. The he is. They're, they're very, very, very good. Uh, they're very professional. They take it very seriously. They yeah. put a lot of time, a lot of work in it. Um, fantastic guy. Mavo does all the work behind the scenes in terms of editing and, and polishing it all and putting it together. But Chaps and Brownie, they're a fantastic crew. In fact, you know, they come up with the Rabideau sort of podcast. Mm. Um, they, were, they were the pilot programs, I guess, for, for the rest of us. They build a great following across all the the social um, social channels, and we saw Mavo at the Ironmark High Performance Centre on on Saturday, getting all his footage on his new camera, and he was there. He got interviewed by Bronte. We mentioned Bronte earlier about the great job she did ground announcing. She interviewed the three boys from Rabbitohs Radio down there on the on the sideline, and keeping those three in checks a hard, hard enough job. So <laughs> she she did well uh, with her interview, and he was down there recording the runouts and everything, and he gets it all on his social media. So. They're doing a great job, the boys. Brownie was telling me that the uh, Bronte went to hand Mavo the uh, microphone and he dropped it. So I don't know. <laughs> what that's, I don't know what that's, no, what that's I did it. notice, what I did notice was Mavo let her hold the microphone. <laughs> Brownie took it off her. He oh, had plenty yeah. to say, Brownie. Uh, and he wasn't giving that mic uh, back. Brownie could talk for Australia, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> <laughs> very, you very said, good. You, you just said they were recording all the runouts, Jez. Well, they play, was the cricket on there on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple of cricket scores. Yeah, yeah. I've got to say, 30, 30 40 point scores. But uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, so let's see how well everyone knows Steve Maven. Now, if you're looking for your next epic holiday, maybe a long weekend away with your mates, or you really need to get to that game in Dubbo in a couple of weeks, then it's time to What If It. What If has great deals on accommodation, flights, car hire, and more. And, of course, as the official travel partner of the South Sydney Rabbitohs, you can head to whatif.com slash rabbitohs and use the promo code rabbitohs15, and you can save 15% on select hotels. Now, conditions apply there, but if you're a bit... Um, laid out of the blocks and you want to get out to Dubbo and you don't want to ring around a thousand different uh, little uh, B&Bs and all that sort of stuff to try and find yourself some accommodation, whatif.com slash rabbitos is the place to go. That's right. They get you the best prices and then on top of that, they get you a 15% discount and that's not just on accommodation, it's also on uh, transport, air travel, uh, car hire, whatever it might be. So I highly recommend that people jump online and uh, use the Rabbitohs 15 code to get their discount. Beautiful. Whatif.com slash Rabbitohs. Use that code Rabbitohs15. What if it's Aussie for travel? And the nerves set in. We talked about nerves (laughs) earlier on before run out and the big games. This is my big game every fortnight. <laughs> Shannon's joke of the week. Jez, uh, you're in safe hands. Never fear. Never fear. Shannon Donato is here. Oh, I'm full of fear. Anyway, here we go. Well, <laughs> there's once this guy. He's 
Good Wallamaloo boy. Have I ever mentioned I'm from Wallamaloo? Yeah, I'm a couple of times. A couple of hundred times? Yeah. Okay. Just anyway. not quite as much as you were, um, that you say you're from Vaucluse, but that's okay. <laughs> Vaucluse, please. Please. I can't even afford to spell that. All right. All right. So there's a good Wallamaloo guy and... Uh, you know, he's lived a life of debauchery, you know, drinking and womanising and uh, doing all those bad things in life. He decides he needs to get his life together. So he says, I'm It's not a biography, it. mate. <laughs> 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 this joke's called The Mark oh. Ellison Story. <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. There we go. <laughs> uh, Ella's landed one early. Well played, Ella. <laughs> So he's lived a life of debauchery and, you know, womanising and drinking and all this kind of stuff. And he thinks, that's it. I need to live a pure life. So he goes and decides to join a monastery with the monks and the abbots and those kind of things. And he goes and signs up and signs this monastery where they live a very um, austere life of, um, you know, poverty. And, you know, he signs up but he doesn't realise there's also a vow of silence in this monastery. The head monk says to him, that's okay, you know, it teaches you about what's really important in life. Too much talking, too much drinking, all this not good. Just have the bare basics. So he explains that it's a vow of silence and, you know, very basic living. He says, that's all right, I'm committed to this, I'm going to do it. So he does it and he's living in this cold stone little monastery room and he's got this hard wooden bread and a little thin blanket and he's just eating porridge, breakfast, lunch and dinner for 10 years. The monk says, actually, you've been really committed. After 10 years, if you've done really well, we actually let you say a couple of words. Is there anything you'd like to say? And the uh, the monk says, well, the now monk, the ex Wallamaloo boy says, food bad. Head monk goes, oh, okay. Picks up the food. He's been eating porridge for 10 years. So anyway, he goes back into his cell and he's praying every day and he's freezing in his cold cold cell and uh, eating his slightly better food. Keeps, doesn't say a word for 10 years. The head monk's really impressed. He gets him up. He says, son, you've done a really good job in this austere, pure life of poverty. He says, feel free to say another couple of words. And he says, uh, room's cold. And so they get him a, a blanket and a nice a mattress and, and he's praying every day for 10 years and the head monk goes, this is amazing, 30 years. Get him up, he can say a few words and says, my son, is there anything you'd like to say? And the ex Wallamaloo boy says, yes, I quit. Head monk looks at him and he says, I'm not surprised, you haven't stopped whinging since you got here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, very good. Relief uh, just I pulls over my body. <laughs> very good. Oh, very oh, good. Dude. All, All right. kill me. Hello, you're on next week. Hopefully you're back in here to tell us uh, your joke, yeah. but if not, we might be seeing you on Zoom. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping he takes a 10-year vow of silence or something. <laughs> After That's 10 years, good Shannon joke, yeah. no good. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening once again. If you've got any suggestions for topics for our show, make sure you tweet us at SSFC Rabbitohs or jump on a rabbitohs.com.au slash podcasts and you can fill in the little form there and send us your topic suggestions. We'd love to hear some uh, things that you'd like to hear um, everyone talk about. So please send those in. Don't forget to give us a review and a, a five-star rating if you feel that we deserve it on our on your podcast app. And tune into the other podcasts on the Rabbitohs podcast Podcast network. We get our media conferences throughout the week. We have the audio version of the Rabbitohs Insider. And then, as we spoke about before, Rabbitohs Radio with Chaps Mavo and Brownie. It's always great to hear their thoughts on the, the game. They talk a, a little bit more of uh, each week's game and, and the game before as well. So it'll be interesting to, to hear uh, their thoughts around Magic Round this week up against the Sharkies. So uh, they generally come out around the weekend, the start of the week, and then ours comes out later on in the week and we'll be back next week with more from the Top 4 pod- Podcast it's powered by Audio Technica proudly presented by What If and gentlemen great to uh, spend some more time very close and personal with you Shannon and Ello over Zoom 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you guys have a great night tonight going home and being out of the bubble and everything. I'm, I'm set up here tonight. I've got breakfast ready for the morning. I've got our sponsor's product here, the Power 8 to finish off. And, of course... That's sanitizer. <laughs> sanitizer. <laughs> yeah, well played, Alan. <laughs> well, mate, you, you, you enjoy living life in the bubble. Uh, Jez and I are off for some yumcha. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Does menu log yeah. deliver to the bubble? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> they might be able to leave it just outside the fence at Redford <laughs> Oval. Uh, <laughs> can, you tell, can you tell Wayne that they... Grappa delivers menu log from <laughs> <laughs> to Redfern, okay? I don't think he cares, does he? And if it, if it doesn't, we'll make sure it does. Yeah. I'm sure he doesn't care, Hello, to be honest. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Right, as we said, the top four podcast, powered by Audio Technica, proudly presented by What If. We will see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Rabbitohs Top 4 Podcast. Powered by Audio Technica and proudly presented by What If, official travel and pathways partner of the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Support the club and visit whatif.com forward slash Rabbitohs to book your next trip. Don't forget to use the code Rabbitohs15 to get 15% off select hotels. Conditions apply. What If, it's Aussie for travel. Please leave us a five-star rating and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Up the rabbit eyes.